announcements. So we are going to be in Luke chapter 18 today. We're going to be starting with part two. And if I'm back next week, we'll do part one. Trust me, it totally makes sense. In chapter 17, which we'll do next time, uh, Jesus talks about his second coming. And in chapter 18, which we're doing today, he talks about his first coming. So logically, you would have to do those backwards, right? So today we'll be in chapter 18. This is the first study in a series uh, looking at the journey to Jerusalem. The end of Jesus' ministry at his first coming when he's moving towards the place where he would die. And as he makes that run up, as he, as he travels down south to Jerusalem with his disciples, he has many very interesting encounters. He reveals many awesome truths. And he spills the beans on some things he used to be a little more cryptic about earlier on in the Gospels. He really starts to get to be open as the end is drawing near. And he doesn't have to worry anymore about making the end draw near too quickly. And so he gets to say even more in these latter passages. So the first revelation we're going to look at is the one that explains the first coming. It's going to be at the end of chapter 18. We'll, we'll kind of work our way towards it. We'll take apart a, a few of the encounters he has during the journey. And then he makes the revelation down in uh, verse 31 or so. And he explains why he's there the first time and what it's all for, what it all means. But we're going to start a little further back. We'll start in chapter 18, verse 9. Go ahead and read with me through verse 14. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. Being righteous is not usually the kind of thing you would expect Jesus to denounce. Usually you would expect him to promote that. But what are we really seeing here? Well, we're seeing him talk about some good things, right? This Pharisee says, I pray, I fast, I give tithes. Those are all good things. Nothing wrong with those. The issue is the pride. The issue is the way he's praying. I don't know if you caught it there. I love the way that Luke slips it in. He says, he prayed with himself. <laughs> kind of tells you what the prayer is all about, right? But in this story here is some really awesome truth. And I don't think they're too well hidden, but I want to bring them out just in case you missed one or two of them. First off, everyone's a sinner. At the end of the parable, he says that one man was justified and the other wasn't. But that means that both men needed to be justified. So the fact that both needed to be justified means they were both sinners. They had both done wrong. So first off, they're both sinners. And in truth, everyone is a sinner. And so besides Jesus, no one can work their way up to righteousness. No one can earn righteousness on their merits. You would have to be perfect. You can do a whole lot of good stuff, but it never gets rid of the bad. The bad's still there. Jesus never did any of the bad stuff, so he actually did earn righteousness. And so since everyone needs justification, I think the last truth that's in here is just the amazing truth of the gospel and that's that you can receive it if you humbly ask for it in faith. And that's an amazing thing. He doesn't get into the whole gospel here. He doesn't explain how that works. He just says it's true. He was justified. He went home. And what did he do to get that? What did he do to earn that? Nothing. He just asked for it. Humbly asked for it. He said, God, have mercy on me. And so this parable was actually born out in real life. We have two named tax collectors in the New Testament, Zacchaeus and Matthew. Both of them, when they were confronted with their sin, were guilt-ridden. They were destroyed by what they had done, what they had become, and they turned. Jesus presented them with their sin, and they turned. They immediately started 
doing the right thing. Matthew even started following Jesus, became one of his disciples. And we also have the counterexample in real life. Almost every Pharisee on record, with very few little exception, uh, they were self-righteous. They were absolutely certain of their righteousness. And they had decided which rules a man ought to follow to be righteous, which makes it pretty easy. I mean, let's be real. If you're on the playground and you make up the rules as you go and you redefine the technicality so that you're always in the right, you get called out on it. As an adult, though, if you're someone in authority, then you're just being a strong leader, right? Somehow that's how the Pharisees saw it. Make up the rules as I go, change them when they don't suit me, and therefore I'm always in the right. That's a facade, though. That's fake. And in the next two sections, we'll keep reading Luke 18, we're going to see that there are more of these real-life examples in individuals, not just generic groups of people. The first example we're going to see is an example of the, the humblest, the lowliest. And then later we'll see an example of the opposite extreme, someone who is so puffed up, so prideful as to call themselves perfect. So let's look at verses 15 through 17. Then they also brought infants to him that he might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked him. But Jesus called them to him and said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. For of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. That's a pretty big statement. You can kind of see the disciples, right? They're, they're with Jesus. They're close in his inner circle. They've decided their importance is based on the fact that they were chosen. And I mean, these little kids, what do they have to offer? But who really judges a baby like that? Has anyone ever looked at a baby and thought, wow, they haven't accomplished much? <laughs> I mean, what human would do that? That makes no sense. You know, well, they haven't contributed much to society. They haven't helped anyone lately. They're really just a drain on their mother. Like, who thinks like that? And yet, that's somehow how the disciples decided to judge the children. And sometimes we can do the inverse and we feel less guilty about it. We say, well, I do have this ability and I have accomplished this and I can offer this. And we come to God and we say, here's what I want to give to you. And here's what I want to offer to you. And God, let me take control of this and I'll make it 10 times better. I'll improve the efficiency of that and I'll make this work. And why can't that leader do it? Well, I can. But the fact is, when you go to compare yourself, you should not compare yourself to the baby. You'll come out ahead every time, but that's kind of not the point. You should. <laughs> The real comparison is between you and Jesus. Well, then it doesn't look so good. The distance between I and Jesus, you and Jesus, is so grand, so monumental, it kind of puts us and the baby looking like we're pretty close. Suddenly, we're in the same corner, and there's not that much distance. And so it's interesting that Jesus says to the baby, come. Come. He looks at the baby, he loves the baby, and he says, come to me. He looks at the child and he says to the child, I love you, come to me. And he looks at us, and he loves us, and he says to us, come to me. There's no difference from his perspective. We're all over here in this one pool called humanity. He calls each of us. So for us to try and divide up and say, well, they're lesser, they're greater, he's done this, she's done that, oh, they haven't done much, is so silly. To Jesus, it's it's so little difference. And so he calls each of us. He asks for each of us. Now, don't get me wrong. You can still do good and bad stuff. It's not like achievement means nothing. It's just that it's not the achievement. You see, you can do things that please God, and you can do things that fill him with wrath. Your actions really do have an effect, but that doesn't change your value in his eyes. Your value is fixed because you are his creation. He desires that all would come to him as a child to join his kingdom without thinking about how great an addition you'll make to it. To just humbly come to him and ask for mercy and ask for that mercy in faith. Now, in the next few verses, we're going to see the opposite. So go ahead with me. We're, we'll take this apart in smaller pieces. First, just the first two. So 18 and 19. Now, a certain ruler asked him, 
saying, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. It's kind of an odd answer to the question, right? But I think he really is answering. I think he's baiting him. There's a bit of a test here. You see, people in Jesus' inner circle, a few of them have started to realize that he's the son of God and that that means he is God. Not everyone's figured this out yet. Not everyone's really tracking, but a few have. And this man says, I want eternal life. And so the test is out there. Now, Jesus knows his heart. He knows where this guy's coming from and why he's asking. But the test is as much for the man to realize his own heart as it is for the group to learn a valuable lesson. Many will come to Jesus with ulterior motives. They want to get something. They just want to receive riches, power, eternal life. And they have no interest in serving Jesus. They have no interest in God, his will, what's important to him. None whatsoever. Now, Jesus could just look at the man and he could tell. But asking a question like this, phrasing it like this, turning it back to him in another question, this makes it hard for the man to pursue his original question without revealing his own heart, his own nature. And so Jesus is going to reveal to him what he lacks, what he's missing. Because so far, the man thinks he only is missing one thing, and that's eternal life. So check out how this keeps going, verses 20 through 21. You know the commandments. This is still Jesus talking. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. All these things I have kept from my youth? Now, Jesus left out a few things, right? He only lists the commandments that have to do with how you treat people. And specifically, these commandments are how they, you're forbidden to treat people. <laughs> these are none of the good things. They're only the bad things. But he left out something else. The first commandments in the Ten Commandments are all about how your relationship with God should look. And Jesus just skips over that. So he skipped two things here. He skipped the relationship with God and the positive ways you would treat people. He's only listed the negative things that you should not do. That's pretty strange in and of itself. We'll come back to that. Stranger to me is that this man could stand there across from Jesus and say, yeah, I've done those since I was a child. I don't even think the most puffed up Pharisee would claim this. The most puffed up Pharisee might claim something like, now that I'm older, now that I'm wiser, now that I'm learned in the ways of the law, I have kept the law. I have done all these things. But if you said, did you when you were three? They might look at the floor. <laughs> if their parents weren't around, maybe they would attempt to say something like that. But who here could ever stand in front of their parents and say, I was a perfect child? Who could do that? Really? Now, I worked in children's ministry for 10 years before I moved up to middle school. I met some really good kids, great kids. And sometimes on first meeting, I would start to wonder, what are their parents doing? They are so perfect. What is going on? And you talk to their parents after, and, and it was like an eye roll moment. Most parents can barely contain it. It just springs out. And the truth is, none of us are perfect kids. It doesn't matter what we turn into. We needed help. We needed training. We needed correction. All of us did. No one is born perfect except for Jesus. He managed to keep it up the whole time from the start. So when he says this, when the man says, oh yeah, I've kept those since my youth, and on the list is honor your father and mother, I know, he's lying. So what is that? Well, that's self-righteousness. It brings us right back to the parable we finished with in the long list of parables. It's, it's a self-righteous person. They've decided they're righteous. So he's missing several things, but there's one big piece that's going to unlock it all, that's going to move him in the right direction, start to collect those things he lacks. And Jesus springs it on him. Look at verses 22 through 27. We'll see the end of this encounter. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful, he said, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. 
For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, who, can, who then can be saved? But he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Jesus singled out the thing that mattered most to him. And he said, this is what you need to lose. You see, the man had no real interest in God, the will of God, the things that were important to God. Instead of having God on top in his life, at the the prime throne of his life, the number one priority on his list, he had money. And it's not that money is inherently bad. It's not that money is something you shouldn't or can't have. It's that money is not meant to be your God. Money is not meant to be the number one priority. It's meant to serve all the other priorities. And so if God's not on top, you have a problem. And so God knew this. Jesus knew this about the man. And so he said, okay, your number one's got to go. He paired that with a second request, though. He said, and then come follow me. You see, this wasn't just a money is bad statement. This is him singling out what is keeping you from eternal life and then him telling him what will get him eternal life, following Jesus. It's pretty clear instructions, yet the man did not take it well. And so we see Jesus putting the pressure on there. And I think the same is true for each of us. If there is something more important than our life, in our life than God, we will refuse to follow him. And so that thing, whatever it is, will always stand in the way until it's not the number one thing in our life. Sometimes that number one thing is taken from us. And there's nothing we can do. It's just gone. And we hit rock bottom and we find God. Sometimes we realize, we wake up and go, this can't stand. I can't live like this. And we get rid of it ourselves. In either case, step two is very important. Follow Jesus. And then Jesus has to answer Peter real quick, because Peter has to answer Jesus real quick. This is Peter's mode. As you read through the Gospels, most of the times Peter speaks at all, it's to interject kind of a half-hearted point that probably didn't need saying. But it's great because Peter stands in for us. It's what we would have said, right? We're good at putting our foot in our mouth. That's the other thing we have in common with babies on the scale. There's way not as good as Jesus, and we put our feet in our mouth. They're flexible. We're dumb. It works out. So Peter puts his foot in his mouth. He says this. Check out verse 18. Or sorry, uh, verse 28. Then Peter said, see, we have left all and followed you. So he said to them, Jesus says to them, assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents, or brothers, or wife, or children, for the sake of the kingdom of God, who shall not receive many times more in this present time, and in the age to come, eternal life. Peter is so quick to point out, we passed that test. We did that. Well, Jesus never gave them that test. I mean, he kind of did when he said, drop everything and follow me. But that was years ago at this point. Bringing that up now is like saying, I have a high school diploma and you're in your 70s. It kind of doesn't mean anything. Like, why are you bringing this up now? Well, because Peter wants what the guy was asking about. And I think that's good. I don't want to, you know, shame Peter. I think he had a great desire. He saw the man ask, how do I get eternal life? Jesus goes through the whole conversation and in there, Peter latches on to the request. Give up all you have and come follow me. Peter says, I did that. And in fact, all of us disciples did that. So he's like waiting for Jesus to finish the sentence. Now, Jesus could rebuke him for like the pride or the wrongheadedness of, you know, gimme, gimme, gimme. But instead, Jesus ups the ante and he says, you're not just going to get eternal life. That's not even the half of it. I think it's important when we talk about eternal life to talk about what we'll be doing in that eternal life. If, if you have eternal life, but not a perfect world to live in, that's kind of meaningless. And if you had a perfect world, but only a day to live there, that's kind of meaningless. But to have a perfect world and an eternal life both together, that, that is it. Everlasting life to spend with God, with his people, doing all the perfect things there are to do, That is worth it. 
And so what Jesus answers here is so awesome. And we'll get to it next time when we go back to chapter 17. He talks about his kingdom. And he says several things about it. But on the one hand, it's awesome and it's perfect. On the other hand, it starts now. There's a day when it comes in full and there's nothing but his kingdom. The whole earth is renewed. But now there is a real kingdom extended into your heart when you make Jesus Lord. What is a kingdom? You ever thought about it? It's wherever the king has reign. And the borders can change and, and morph and rivers might wiggle in their path through the mountainside and suddenly the borders are different. But it's wherever the king has reign, that's the kingdom. And so Jesus said when he was on the earth, before he even died on the cross, he said the kingdom's here now. Why? Because there were already people putting him in charge of their life. There were already people respecting him as Lord. Immediately, that's it. The kingdom exists. It's in their hearts. And in this life, you have a great big family. The truth is, whether you feel it every day or you don't feel it every day, as a Christian, you are connected to the biggest family on the planet. You are part of that family. And so he says, no one's left more than they've gained. You can't leave that many people. You barely know that many people. But you can gain this whole family just by walking into the kingdom. We're going to get into the heavier part here. Jesus is about to drop a bombshell. He's going to pull the disciples aside, and this is it. He's going to give a revelation about why he's here, what the first coming of Jesus Christ was all about, and how it's going to end. So look with me, verses 31 through 34. He's going to start to talk about the how we can join his kingdom. Verse 31, then he took the 12 aside and said to them, behold, we are going up to Jerusalem and all things that are written by the prophets that are, um, by the prophets concerning the son of man will be accomplished for he will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked and insulted and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not know the things which were spoken. Every time I read that last line, it just makes me cringe. It breaks my heart that these guys could walk with Jesus for three years. And this isn't even the first time he's announced his death. It's just the plainest. This is the one where he comes out and just says it in the most vanilla language you could. He lists all the things that will happen to him leading up to the death, and then he says, and then he'll die. And it's not cryptic to them. It shouldn't be. The Son of Man is his favorite title for himself. There's lots of different titles that are in Old Testament prophecy that talk about what God is going to do in the future. Uh, the Messiah, the, the strong right arm of the Lord, the Son of God, the Son of Man. These titles all get used for Jesus. And he claims them whenever he talks in the third person. So maybe you're wondering, like, why does he always do that? He's claiming the prophecies of the Old Testament as being about himself by using the titles from the Old Testament prophecies. And so he's saying, that's me. So when he does this in front of them, it's been three years. He's been doing it the whole time. They should get it by now, and yet it was hidden from them. They couldn't grasp it. The Old Testament talks about Jesus' first coming a lot. A lot, a lot. In the New Testament, though, there is almost as many mentions of how Jesus fulfills the Old Testament prophecies. He's really the whole point of the Old Testament, not just a fulfillment of prophecy, but a fulfillment of purpose. Why was the Old Testament even written? Couldn't the events just play out without the book? Yeah, but then there's nothing to point to Jesus that lasts. So there's even a few places in the New Testament that talk about specifically which prophecies were fulfilled by what. He mentions some here. Those things he puts in the list are not a mistake. They're not random. Everything he mentions in these few verses, 31 32, 33, are things that were prophesied hundreds of years earlier in the Old Testament. So he's calling out prophecies on his little bullet point list as he says those words. There's even a moment after his resurrection, one of my favorite moments. He goes on a walk with two of his disciples. As far as I can tell, they're not of the 12. They're just two other disciples. And it's after he's come back from the dead 
and he's walking with them and their eyes are restrained from recognizing him. They can't tell who he is. And he just plays coy. He says, what's up? They're leaving Jerusalem on this walk. They're walking away to another town and they've just witnessed the crucifixion, the burial, all that. But they don't know he's back from the dead. They have heard the tomb was empty. They just assume natural causes, right? Tombs are always empty. That just normally happens. So he's walking with them. And he, playing coy, just says, uh, what? What's happened? Well, I mean, anything could have happened, right? And they said, don't you know that the, the, there was this guy named Jesus of Nazareth, and, and we thought he was the Messiah, and he did all these amazing things, and, and then he died before his kingdom was set up. So I guess he wasn't the Messiah. And that's their conclusion. If he's dead, he can't be the Messiah. What does Jesus say? So over in Luke 24, uh, same book, different chapter, 25 through 27, it says this. Then he said to them, oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. So Jesus goes all the way back to the beginning of the Bible and he's recounting all these passages to them that point to Jesus' ministry and specifically his death and his resurrection. And he has a lot to work with here. Now, granted, he didn't have a Bible with him. I don't know if you guys realize the Bibles back then were scrolls and each scroll was a book unless it was a really small book and maybe you could fit like two or three on a scroll, and the scrolls would like take up this whole podium for one book. So if you want to carry your Bible around with you, you'd need like a cart to, to stack them in. I mean, it was not easy. So he's just recounting these off the top of his head, all these passages. So in the Old Testament, we can count over 300 prophecies about Jesus' first coming alone. Just the first coming. Over 300 they're actually hard to tabulate because sometimes there's like three in one sentence and sometimes there's one and then there's another one about the attribute of the thing that's coming true and so they're, they're not sure should that count as two, the occurrence and the attribute, or should it count as one? So it's a little fuzzy. So over 300, general tabulation. He fulfilled all of them between 4 BC and 30 AD. All of them. We can argue about the exact number, but there's none that we can point to and go, Ah, see, he missed one. There's none. That's wild because out of these 300, there's a pretty good chunk that aren't even done by him. They're done to him. And some of them happened before he was born. It's really hard to fake that kind of stuff. You know, like before you're born, try and get your parents to move cities while your mom's pregnant. Come on, come on, come on. That's really hard to do. Now, granted, you could be born in Bethlehem grow up and realize, hey, isn't the Messiah supposed to be born in Bethlehem? I could pretend to be the Messiah. You could do that. But even then, some of these are ones you would have to get people to do to you, and they would have to be in on it with you. And, and the number starts to get a little astronomical as you start to add up how many things were said about him, said to him, done to him, uh, done adjacent to him in a whole other city, but recorded as having happened. It starts to get astronomical. So let's take the eight most famous Bible prophecies about Jesus. So the eight most famous, the odds of those eight happening to any one human in all of human existence, just randomly, is one in uh, one quintillion. Okay, that's eight. So one in a quintillion. That would be like picking a silver dollar, one marked silver dollar, we'll just paint a silver dollar blue, and we'll drop it into a pile of silver dollars, and you have to pick that silver dollar on the first try blindfolded, okay? And you don't know where it got dropped. That would kind of change things. Also, the pile happens to be two feet deep, the size of Texas. That's one quintillion, okay? Texas two feet deep in, sol in, in silver dollars, that's one quintillion. So one in a quintillion for eight of the prophecies. Now, if you double up the prophecies, you go to 16 prophecies, it doesn't double the odds. It's not how odds work. Uh, so if you double it up to 16 of the most famous prophecies, the odds of that happening to one random human in all of human existence is one in 10, I swear this is a word, quatu or decillion. 
So imagine a pile of silver dollars with one marked silver dollar, okay? But the pile is so large it has its own gravity and it forms a sphere out in space. It is the size of Neptune's orbit. Do I have that up here? Okay, so if you look at Neptune's orbit, okay, and that's just the radius, right? We're missing the other half of that orbit. Uh, the Earth is, a, is non-existent, it's an arrow, uh, and the sun is a dot. So imagine the size of the sun, that's pretty big. It's a dot. Neptune's orbit, that is the size of your pile of silver dollars. Now he didn't fulfill eight, he didn't fulfill 16. He fulfilled all the 300 plus prophecies. So let's pick out just the 48 that weren't him doing something. Just the 48, there were other people doing things. Just the 48 that were done to him, said about him. Okay, just those 48. Those 48 randomly happening to the same human in all of human existence is kind of hard to picture. I'm, I'm gonna try, but it's hard, okay? The words are starting to get a little made up. It would be roughly the same as one in 100 unquin qua gentillion. And I'm not kidding, that is a number, it's just not a real number, it's the kind of number you have to make through a system of prefixes written in a book that says if you wanna make a number that looks like this, use these prefixes in this order. That's how you make this number. No one uses this number. It's not in math, it's not in accounting. Our, our national debt has not risen that high, which is really cool. It is a number with over 150 zeros on it. You can just kind of picture. Oh yeah, look there, a picture. So that's picturable. You can picture the number of zeros, but what you can't picture is the order of magnitude that this is. So imagine a pile of electrons because silver dollars is gonna get us way too far out of the ballpark. So imagine a pile of electrons. They all have negative spin. I know, it's easy to imagine, right? Pile of electrons, they all have negative spin. They're in a giant sphere, and inside that sphere, randomly located is one electron with a positive spin. So they're all negative, one's positive. You have to pick the one positive spin electron out of all the negative spin electrons. The sphere to contain those electrons, all bumped up next to each other as tight as they can be. I'm gonna have to read this, it's quite hard. That sphere would be 30 quintillion, 91 quadrillion, 242 trillion light years across. Okay, so diameter, right? From one side of the sphere to the other. Now that number is a little more approachable, but remember we're measuring in light years and we're containing electrons. To put that perspective, the, the proposed size of the observable universe is 36 septillion times smaller. Follow me on that. 36 septillion universes could fill this sphere. Fill that with electrons, pick the right electron on the first try blindly. That's the odds of one human having 48 of these occurrences all happen to them. It's pretty bad odds. We could, we could just sum it up like that. But he didn't stop. He went on to fulfill all the 300 plus prophecies written hundreds of years before his birth. So what kind of prophecies? How easy or hard are these to fulfill? Let's, let's double check some of these. So to, just the ones that are in reference to his death, we actually have a couple neat little collections where most of them are scattered throughout the Old Testament, here, there, and everywhere. There is two little neat piles you can find. One is in Psalms, one is in Isaiah. And they have just a bunch of details about his death. Now, Psalms is reliably dated to over a thousand years before Jesus. And Isaiah, even by the critical scholars who don't believe in God, they don't believe the Bible's inspired, they don't believe anything in it, they still can't put Isaiah forward of B.C. 500. They still have to admit it was written pre-500 B.C. And they don't even believe the Bible's really real. They just think it's a book. Now, I think Isaiah wrote Isaiah, and he would have written it in the 700s B.C., or at least started it. He lived a while. But... Either way, that's multiple hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. So let's go ahead and read some. Let's jump in. We're going to read some from Isaiah, some from Psalms. Uh, so the first one is in Isaiah 50, verse 6. It says this, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. 
Then over in Psalm 22, 7 and 8 say this, All those who see me ridicule me, they shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Now that might not sound like much of a prophecy until you realize that's a direct quote from the high priest when Jesus was hanging on the cross. It just happens to be written over 500 years before it occurred. Psalm 22, verse 14 says, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue clings to my jaws. Just referencing how thirsty he was up on the cross. You have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. That whole last pair of lines is thick with prophetic events. First off, it says they pierced my hands and my feet. Now that's common for crucifixion victims. That's basically 100%. With, with few exception, crucifixion victims had their hands and feet pierced. What's interesting is this is from the Psalms, which was written a couple hundred years before crucifixion was invented. So mentioning the piercing of hands and feet at that point in history, that's, that's kind of a sore thumb sticking out. That really sticks out as a good prophecy. And it says, I can count on my bones. Well, not true of all of history, but at least in the Roman era, crucifixion victims were often people who had their legs broken while they were on the cross. And in fact, in the story, you can go through the Gospels and find it. They go to break all of the people being crucified that day's legs, and they skip Jesus because he was already dead. You would break their legs and they would die faster. You just didn't want to, you know, stay up with them all night, so you'd kill them quicker. And Jesus didn't need that treatment, so his legs were unbroken. And then it says, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now, if we read through the account of Jesus, this almost seems contradictory. When you divide clothing back then, you would usually tear it back into its original sheets. You'd undo all the seams, and you'd take the cloth. That was useful. You could use it for anything. So they divided his garments. And we actually see that in the Gospels. The, the soldiers at the foot of the cross are dividing up Jesus' garments, and then they come to his outer coat. And his outer coat was hand-knit. It was all one piece. There was no seams. And they go, ah, oh, that's a shame to tear that. But they all wanted it. So what do they do? They gamble. They cast lots for his coat. And so they both divided his garments and cast lots for the coat. Jump over to Isaiah 53. We get even more detail. Isaiah 53, verse 4 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. And this is true. Pilate tried to force him to speak. Eventually, he has a conversation with Pilate. Uh, Herod tried to get him to speak, and Jesus wouldn't even talk to him. Each time he's put on trials, multiple times in a row, he keeps remaining silent, and it's such silence to the point where each time the person trying him, the judge, you know, Pharisee, Pilate, Herod, they all make note of it. Why aren't you defending yourself? Why don't you just open up your mouth and deny the charges? It says he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He knew why he was there. He signed up for this. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? He had no kids. His family line, cut off. For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. And that's true too. There was a rich man who came after he had died and begged for the body of Jesus so he could bury him in his own tomb. He had a richly prepared tomb and he said, I want it for Jesus. Please let me bury him there. 
And then keep going. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He was put, or sorry, he has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He had no kids, but it says he shall see his seed once he's given up his soul. So once he gave himself over to death, then he has offspring. How does that work? Spiritually, the life we can have, the spiritual life that we can receive from Jesus was bought at the cross. And so when we receive him and we get that new life from him, we are the only offspring he has. No physical offspring, but spiritual, yes. He has started, like I said, the biggest family on the planet. We're now part of it. I love that line there. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Keep going though. There's a little more in Isaiah. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant shall justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That is our Jesus. It's so clear here in Isaiah, but it, you can find it all the way back to Genesis. He decided to be the sacrifice we needed. From the beginning, this has always been the plan to stand in our place for God himself to become our sacrifice. First, he became one of us. He became a man, a human. And then he goes and he stands in our place, the place of punishment, the punishment we all have deserved. We've all racked up our own sin debt. And he goes and he pays it at the cross. Last section here, chapter 22 of Psalms, just finish out that chapter Starting at verse 27, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nation shall worship before you for the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust shall bow before him, even he who cannot keep himself alive. A posterity shall serve him. It will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born, that he has done this. Declaring the spreading of the gospel all the way back in Psalm 22, that after his death, the new life that he gave to those who saw, to those who believed, to those who received it from him would spread. It wouldn't just be the people there when he died. It wouldn't just be the people he met after he rose from the dead. It would spread it's all the way back in the Old Testament. Jesus took our punishment and suddenly the way of forgiveness is opened. The word of God has been declaring it since before Jesus even opened the way. From before he even died on the cross, the way being opened was the message of the Old Testament. And now in the New Testament, it's the message that it's happened. The way is now open. And so from thousands of years before Jesus died on the cross, two thousands of years after, God's word has continued to declare the way is open. And so I declare it to you today. Forgiveness, eternal life, the righteousness of Christ himself can be yours. All these things are made available by Jesus' sacrifice. So how do you gain access to it, right? That was the question of the rich man. How do I get that? Maybe his question was incomplete. And clearly he didn't like the answer, but the question was a good question. How do you take hold of all these things that Jesus promises to you? Well, let's finish the chapter. All the way back in Luke 18, I know we've been a few places. Pick back up at chapter 18, verse 35. Then it happened as he was coming near Jericho that a certain blind man sat by the road begging. And hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. Now, Jericho's pretty close to Jerusalem, pretty far from Nazareth. So for this guy to have heard who Jesus is, to know about him, would be pretty remarkable. That's pretty neat. But it seems like he does. Check out 38. And he cried out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. 
He calls him son of David. That means he didn't just know a little, he knew a lot. You see, David was a king back in Israel's history and the Messiah. Now, there were other Messiahs. The, the word Messiah just means chosen, anointed one of God. There were other people that God chose and he used and he anointed them. But over and over in the Old Testament, it keeps referring to the Messiah. The Messiah. The one who's going to do it all. Not just some, not just one thing, all. It's said that he would come from David's family line. King David's lineage would lead down to the Messiah. And so this guy calls out Jesus and says, I know who you are. Now, some people did, like I mentioned, know who he was, but not everyone did. And so I think it's really remarkable that this blind man does. He gets it. He's calling out Jesus. You're here for more than just teaching people. I know the old prophecies. You're supposed to heal the sick. You're supposed to heal the lame. You're supposed to give, and this is an actual Old Testament prophecy, Sight to the blind. You're supposed to do that. So he calls him out. Have mercy on me. And it's not in a prideful way. It's in a humble way. But he's put the ball firmly in Jesus' court. But look at verse 39. So sad. Then those who went before warned him that he should be quiet. But he cried out all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. It's that same attitude from earlier with the little kids. Right? No, 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 no. This isn't what he's doing today. He's been walking and teaching. You, be quiet. Let him teach. Did he not heal? Wasn't that kind of like the number two thing Jesus did? He did it all the time. And yet, still somehow, after the episode with the kids, the disciples are still in that mode of filtration, protection. We have to, we have to keep Jesus at a distance from certain people that might, you know, abuse his abilities. We have, to, we have to try and, you know, protect Jesus. It's not Jesus' attitude. And he wants to correct it. And so when he's called upon a second time and he hears it, it says, so Jesus stood still, this is verse 40, and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he had come near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. When Jesus asked a question he knows the answer to, is one of my favorite moments because it means that the person across from him, the person he's talking to, I get to know them now. He already knows the answer, but he's asking a question that reveals the heart of the person. And this man's broken about his blindness. It is the defining characteristic of his life and he does not want it to be so. It is the thing holding him back. It is the thing troubling him. It is the thing that causes him sorrow day in, day out. And he brings it to Jesus. And I think that's all Jesus asks of us. He just says, what is it you need? What is it that's bothering you? What is it that is so crippling you? And all you have to do is be honest. Don't hide it. Don't wall off. Don't put on that facade. Just say to Jesus, it's this. It's crippling me. It's a sin I'm stuck in. It's a relationship I don't know how to mend. It's something I really do care about more than you, Jesus, and I, I don't know how to stop. Whatever the thing is that has got you bound up, Jesus wants you to just admit it to him because he is the only one who can save you from it. He's the only one that can take that from you and give you life instead. Verse 42, then Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him. Glory in God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. It's faith. We asked that question before we read this. How do you take hold? How do you receive all those things that Jesus has on offer for you? The answer is faith. He was healed because of his faith. Paul tells us that salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ. It's the same. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says this. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. This is the idea. Jesus does all the work. He dies on the cross. He takes the beatings and the scourgings and the punishment. He gives up his life. And you have to ask him, can I have that life? Can I have that forgiveness? Jesus, 
Can you take away what I've done? Can you clothe me in that righteousness? And then, like the disciples asked and he answered, you get more than eternal life. You get a family. Here now and forevermore, in eternity. You get closeness with him. The best part about heaven, God's presence. Hands down. Everything else will be great, but nothing compares to that. You just get to be with God at all times. Him just surrounding you at all times. Jesus died to make that possible, and he has it on offer for you today. I want to pray right now, and if there's anyone today that is struggling, you can pray your own words. I don't know your struggle, but you can be assured Jesus does. He absolutely does. So you can just, you can add your words right in. Jesus, thank you for dying in our place. Thank you for all of the things you've offered to us. Thank you for the family you've provided us. Lord, fill us with your spirit. Give us your strength. Help us, Lord, to further your kingdom. To be so full of your spirit that we can't help but but have it overflow and pour out onto our community, the people around us that you so dearly love. Help us, Lord, to reach them, not just with your gospel, but the whole kingdom, the whole family surrounding them, adopting them in. Help us, Lord, to have no fear in spreading your kingdom. With our heads bowed, if there's anyone here today that needs to take hold of this for the first time, if you're sitting here and you know you need to ask Jesus for that forgiveness, you need to ask him for that eternal life, you want to ask to become part of his family, his kingdom, you can do it right now. He sees you right where you are. He knows every thought in your head and every concern in your heart. But I'm going to ask you to be brave. If you want to join the family of God right now, if you want that forgiveness right now, I would like to pray with you. Would you just stand up? Stand up to show me. He sees you. He knows. Stand up and I'll know too. And I will pray with you. I'll help you out with the words. You can talk to him. You can ask him for all those things. You can be added to his family right now anyone today. Oh Lord, I thank you for all these believers faithfully following you. Guide us in your strength by your spirit to minister, to love the people you have put around us, to guide them back to you, to help them find that new life pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen.